Hello, this uh, video is for BTEC Sport and Exercise Science Unit 11 Sports Massage and specifically is looking at A2 Professional Associations. Now, the professional associations that a sports massage therapist may get some benefit from um, are really important for legal reasons, for um, their own development reasons for support and guidance. Um, what you need to be able to do in your assessment is discuss and evaluate the pros and cons of being associated with or members, members of these different um, associations. And what you really need to do to get, get into this is look on their websites, look at what they offer, look at what they cost, look at what they provide, how they can support professionals, um, and weigh up the pros and cons of these. Now these are the main associations that are listed on your spec. There may be others, um, but I would certainly suggest that you look at all of these and perhaps select some of them to discuss in your work. So they're listed there and the key things that you want to know is what's their role and their function, what the benefits to a sports massage therapist in being a member of the, each association? Do they provi provide any continued professional development, as in training for therapists, or do they expect therapists to do that, you know, as part of requirement uh, as being a member? And how do they support practitioners in maintaining professional standards? doing their treatments and working in the right appropriate safe way. So I'm going to go through and show a slide essentially on each of those main five associations, not because I'm going to read them all out to you word for word. Um, absolutely, you need to pause and have a closer look at each one and you do need to do your own research and look at each website individually. Um, but this is just a flavour of it. Um, you will, as I said, need more extensive research and, and to weigh up each, each association yourself. So, Federation of Holistic Therapists. This is quite a broad um, organisation. It's not explicitly for sports massage therapists. Um, it is about all types of specialisms that give physical therapies or even beauty therapy. So, again, it is quite an umbrella organization but the idea is that um, they're there to give support they're the biggest association in the UK uh, obviously because it's broader you may you know understand that there'll be more members um, and they're quite credible so it is a good connection to have there is a membership cost again check that check the current fees or membership expenses to be part of this organisation and that needs to be weighed up. It might be very much worth every penny. It might be a factor to go against somebody being a member. They may, you know, not be able to afford it quite as much. Um, and they do have a requirement of doing, the, so if you're a member, this organisation expects you to do a certain number of CPD hours every year. So they expect you to do training to keep yourself up to date. But they do offer training and workshops and ultimately can be really supportive. So they're not a specialist sport related organisation, but they are a broad, they're obviously very experienced working in physical therapies. The next one is a sports therapy specialist organisation. So the Society for Sports Therapists. Um, this again would in incorporate multiple different kinds of physical sport therapists. Um, but the fact that they are specialist and specifically relate to sport is, I'm sure, an advantage. They give advice. They give advice on legalities or litigation, um, guidance through any malpractice or how to avoid malpractice, i.e. doing the wrong thing and getting sued. And they offer CPD. There are insurances associated with them so that you have um, confidence to be able to give treatments, not only in this country, but abroad. Um, and they are sort of, again, a very established, very represented organisation. They do require CPD. You can check out exactly what or how much or how many hours. Um, and they do require and demand members to keep up standards of practice um, to ensure that, you know, 
there this is a professional credible organization and professional strand of physical therapies next then the physical association of sports rehabilitators and trainers basrat again another sport specific organization so this merit in that itself it is the uk's regulator in sports rehabilitation so very very central in taking care of people in terms of their rehabilitation within sport or from sports um, fundamentally they are very much about maintaining high standards of practice in training and as you can see it says um, they were founded to ensure all degree courses were of equivalent high standards i think i may have said in a previous video um, there are so many things like online courses for massage or um, weekend courses for massage and you can't possibly learn enough or practice enough to be necessarily safe to practice professionally with something like that so this organization was very much about maintaining the quality of training and provision of people within the rehabilitation profession strict code of conduct requires a certain amount of working hours and insurances are available and you will of course need to understand why massage therapists should must have certain insurances and what those insurances are there is a joining fee you can discuss what you think about that um, and there are expectations if you are a member what you've got to do and how you've got to comply with that membership it does require cbd you can check that out and you have to keep an up-to-date portfolio and you've got to be first aid trained so actually you can see already without even looking too deeply at their website that there are some um, quite explicit expectations which is probably a good thing next the sports massage association this is specifically for sports massage of course because it became a booming business and more and more and more people were becoming involved in doing massage and treating sports massage or, you know treating through sports massage it's become more and more important to uh, provide credibility um, to maintain quality and this organization was uh, founded in 2002 to try to do that um, to make sure that that practitioners were appropriately qualified not just any old person having done a weekend course having a go so there's a lot of education guidance expectation about the ethics of practice the professional educational standards within the profession there's software availability through this association. There's a quite an expensive membership. Um, again, you can discuss the pros and cons of that. You, they provide and expect you to do CPD and have a logbook you can see there and to be first aid qualified. So you can see the first aid is actually quite a consistent expectation of a couple of the associations. Probably a good thing. And then finally, the Complementary and Natural Healthcare Council. So this is a voluntary register for any complementary therapist. So again, this is quite a broad organization and the fact that it's voluntary might, might be something you want to discuss. It's trying in theory to protect everybody, to protect the practitioners, but also to protect the public, um, to know who their therapists are and that they are associated and registered rather than just claiming on a flyer that you've got this that and the other qualification so it's trying to make um, practitioners be accountable um, and on a publicly accessible register they have a role in investigating complaints and they try to ensure of course all is done appropriately and safely and legally now despite it being voluntary um, to be on this register is a good thing. It will um, show that you are complying with some important requirements from this council, that you've got three years experience in relevant environment, that you are a, a, a sort of recognized discipline, that you've got insurance to practice in the UK, you've got no health issues yourself, you've got no criminal you know, convictions. So if you're on the register, you've complied with that. And that's obviously going to look good to any clients or organizations possibly looking to employ you. There is a fee um, and there are requirements for CPD.
Now, going into more explicit research into those five main organisations, you're going to draw your own conclusions about the pros and cons of being a member to some of them. Um, but overall, here's perhaps a sense of some of the benefits. So um, they may recognise your standard of competence. It may be evidence that you are a decent practitioner and credibility to your business, um, particularly, you know, the last council, if you're on the register, it implies that you are doing the right things and you've been doing the right things and you've been checked. So it's kind of that professional seal of approval. Um, it proves you're insured in, in most cases. Um, and therefore is really important in protecting you and supporting you should anything happen, should anybody claim anything, whether true or not, these organisations are there to guide you and support you through the process. Obviously, the ac access to having training, the CPD provision is essential and a requirement in some cases so that you can continue to deliver good quality practice that's safe, that's effective and will get you business. Limitations could be things like the membership fee, the need for you to do ongoing CPD, and that as a requirement, um, you know, you should kind of want to do some anyway, but the fact that you've got to do a certain number of hours for some of the associations may deter um, a therapist from being a member, may put you off. There may be other pros and cons. This is not an exhaustive list in any shape or form. Um, you can always add to some of these.